we go. Well, hi, this is John Sarver and it's Thursday. So uh, GLREA is uh, sponsoring a Zoom. And uh, I'm gonna show just a few slides as an introduction. Uh, uh, we've changed up our kind of uh, scheme for Thursday evening Zoom. So uh, let me, uh, let's see. Well, tonight, uh, and it is Earth Day, uh, happy Earth Day for, to everybody. Uh, John Berry, who's the director of the Appropriate Technology Collaborative, is going to talk about and present Detroit Solar, uh, their educational program about electricity, circuits, and solar power for students of all ages in Southeast Michigan. And I'd like to acknowledge that the Michigan Department of Environment Great Lakes and Energy is a, a financial, financial sponsor for our uh, uh, Thursday evening Zooms. And we do have a little different scheme now. Uh, the first Thursday of each month, uh, starting in June, we're gonna have Ann Arbor Solar Stories, which are hosted by Julie Roth, uh, the manager of the Solarize Ann Arbor program. Uh, some of you have probably attended our clean energy seminars on the second Thursday which are hosted by a GLRE board member, Mark Clevey. And the third Thursday is gonna be Detroit Solar Stories uh, hosted by another uh, board member, Diane Van Buren. And I'll be uh, still hosting on the fourth Thursday of each month. Uh, it'll either be a My Solar Story or Energy Q&A. And actually we have an extra uh, Thursday uh, in this month. And so next week we will have an Energy Q&A which is an open discussion and uh, an opportunity for people to ask questions about energy. Uh, this year, we're celebrating our 30th year anniversary and we'll have a special uh, uh, celebration uh, later this year. Uh, the organization was formed in 1991 and uh, you know we've been advocating and educating ever since uh, it was formed in 1991. And uh, ways you can help, uh, you can renew your uh, membership in GLREA, or if, you, if you're not a member now, you certainly can join. Uh, you, could, you could sponsor a, a teacher or student to be a member. Uh, you can encourage others to join GLREA, or if you want to, you could just make a financial donation to GLREA. And uh, that's it for the introduction. Uh, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to introduce uh, John Barry because he's been working in this field for a zillion years. Uh, he's an architect in Ann Arbor. Uh, like we were kind of chatting before uh, we got started here. Uh, John has been involved with appropriate technology and innovative technologies for, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years, forever. Uh, yeah. But uh, he's uh, back from Guatemala, and uh, it's our, it's our gain. But he's he left his uh, his program in Guatemala in good hands. But uh, John tonight's going to talk about uh, the efforts they're doing with uh, in Detroit, uh, educating uh, students about solar energy. And so, uh, John, uh, you've got the floor. Okay, I'm going to do my best to transfer, do the screen share ritual. And this share. Oh, I'm getting so good at this. And then from beginning. Whoa. Okay. You see what I see? A Detroit solar slide. Everybody. Somebody say yes. It looks good. Yeah. I was I was muted. <laughs> it looks good, John. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Detroit solar, uh, teaching solar in Detroit. It's actually, we're teaching in Southeast Michigan, and you're going to hear a little bit about our philosophy of how, um, of how we teach solar classes and how we would teach classes in general in this situation and um, in every situation where we do teach. We teach uh, in Latin America and uh, several places in Southeast Michigan. Uh, so happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you for being here on Earth Day. I feel privileged to be able to speak to you today. Um, and here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover a bit of the background of uh, the Appropriate Technology Collaborative, which is the nonprofit I work for, and then the Detroit Circuits and Solar classes, a little bit about getting solar jobs, practical solar installations. It's an important part of what we do. 
Um, some of the resources that are available in Detroit, which are um, hot off the press and, um, and very well put together. And then a little bit about some of the possible, some of our demonstration projects that we have had in the past um, where we've had volunteers work with local kids. And then a little bit about Solarize Ann Arbor, which is stretched because I'm going to be hosting a Solarize Ann Arbor group and we'll carry it on from there, questions and answers. So that my background or the background of the program really, I start, I have 36 years in sustainable design. Um, and that's architecture, industrial design, um, product design, and program design now. I actually uh, ended up designing um, ways of getting technologies and things like solar power into people's hands. Uh, 15 years experience working in Latin America where I'm there about half the time this last year, of course, I wasn't there at all. I went back just recently and realized that they don't need me. Um, uh, we have a program there called Mayan Power and Light, which is very similar to what we're doing in Detroit. Um, it creates solar jobs. And then we talk about the practical demonstration projects. So my background is I design technology for low-income people. Uh, and um, here are three out of uh, over a dozen technologies that we've created that are in use around the world. One is a solar vaccine refrigerator. It uses heat from the sun to make things cold. Um, it's, uh, it's a closed system. It has a box of charcoal at the very top of it. You can see um, uh, uh, the student there making his final presentation. Um, and anyway, it heats up the charcoal and down below there's a Coleman cooler and it's filled with bottles of ethanol and the bottles of ethanol get very cold. That's the uh, thermodynamics happens in between the two. Um, the, there's a treadle pump for rural farmers. It's in use, it was downloaded over 5,000 times the first year. Uh, it, and we get feedback from people all around the world. We get feedback from 70 different countries. This treadle pump for, for about 100 million farmers, uh, 100 million farmers could triple their income if they had a treadle pump such as the one that that student is um, playing on. He, the group of students designed this, they put the design drawings online and people copied them all over the world. And uh, when a farmer can triple their income, they're essentially out of poverty with one invention in, you know, immediately in one year. Um, and on the very right hand side, you see the 100% recycled generator that we designed it's made out of disc brakes, a wheel hub, and microwave oven parts. Microwave ovens have uh, uh, big magnets in them and they have big coils of wires. And if anybody knows how generators work, that's what you need. You need big magnets, you need big coils of wires. And, um, and so that there can run continuously. It's, it's like a, as strong as a wheel is on a car. Um, and uh, if it's under relatively light load if it's on a water wheel and it essentially can run continuously for years at a time. So that's the type of stuff that we design. Um, and what I found out from designing products and getting things into people's hands in developing countries is that the biggest change that can happen in a person's life is to go from having no electricity to having electricity. So solar power is this huge change in people's status all around the world. There's a billion people right now who still use candles and kerosene to see at night and 10 watts of solar power would help them step right out of poverty. The average person when they get solar power, just a couple of LED light bulbs, they make $35 more per year. The kids stay in school several years longer. That sort of thing takes place. I just wanted to let you know, solar is important at all levels. So I've been working in solar. John, you'll recognize this building. Um, uh, people from Unisolar came to my office one day and they said that they had the ability to put solar shingles on a, um, a building and would I be able to help them? And my first thought was my house. And then I thought that's not the right thing to do. I was on the board of directors of Urban Options um, in uh, East Lansing, Michigan, and that is a perfect place to have a demonstration project for um, uh, uh, an appropriate technology. So this is one of the early solar projects that I was associated with, but that was the start of, uh, of working on solar projects for me. So I date back to at least, John, do you remember 1995? Is that when the solar roof went on there? 
That sounds about right. Okay, I'm just guessing. I, I, the little gray cells don't go back that far. So anyway, okay. I also uh, 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 have been a consultant with the United States Air Force. I wrote the green building specifications for them um, and helped uh, with the planning of an uh, Air Force base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. I also helped Warner Brothers with their green building specifications and also their specifications for making their sets green. Um, and that was back in the um, early 2000s. So circuits and solar is the class that we teach. What's important about this class, besides that it teaches about electricity and it's a good STEM-based education, is that we treat all classes equally. So we've been teaching this class in Detroit Public Schools, Detroit Charter Schools, Ann Arbor Private Schools, Ann Arbor Public Schools, um, and in schools in Guatemala, and um, open to open, generally open to the public classes. Um, here are two of our teachers that teach the class. Um, one is Josh, who's now the director of uh, MakerWorks in Ann Arbor, which is where our office has been. And um, on the right-hand side, you see Angelo. He's working on a project there in Guatemala, but he is a, a resident of Michigan. Um, so, uh, and we teach this basic introduction to electricity class that most people here that are listening to this talk have heard of or have seen this type of thing before. We teach how, atoms work theoretically and um, electrons and how electrons move um, in certain types of materials and how they don't move in other types of materials. And we cover static electricity and uh, alternating current and direct current and series and parallel connections, that sort of stuff, which is common what circuits are and what uh, electricity is. Then we also cover these interesting things of what goes into a circuit? What, what's in your cell phone? How do these things actually all work together? And there's a language associated with, um, uh, with electronics. Uh, it's, a, it's a written language, a drawn language. Uh, there's a, right here is a light emitting diode and the symbol for it is on the right hand side and it's this triangle shape with a couple of lightning bolts going off of it. And that means that it's, diode is triangle, lightning bolts means light goes off of it. And, um, and there's another symbol for a resistor, and there's a number, oh, and then there's a symbol for a battery, which is on the left-hand side of the diagram here, and this is a diagram of a circuit. And students learn, students learn multimodally. They learn, our classes are often very hands-on. There's a lot of things to play with. Sorry, during COVID, we have not done that. Um, but there's a lot of things to play with. You can learn with your hands. You can also learn by drawing. That's another separate part of your brain that, that works. It helps people remember things. Um, and, uh, and so we teach students how to diagram circuits before they actually build things. We also teach how to use this very interesting device, which is a, um, a multimeter. And um, that, you know, this I use all the time around the house because I repair items rather than throw them out. So I, I've repaired my microwave oven, I think three times in the last two years. And I couldn't have done any of them without this. So I te we teach students how to use this. It's a practical skill in addition to a skill that they need for learning about circuits and solar. <clears throat> they get to work with what's called a breadboard. This is professional uh, mock-up equipment for making circuits of all sorts of different types. We had a student once from the University of Michigan use one of these breadboards to mock up an EKG for babies. Um, and he did it in a weekend. And he also programmed the chip in the weekend to do it. Um, which we have very bright students um, that work with us. Anyway, so students get to play with professional grade equipment also to make circuits. And so that's the circuit that we drew, you just saw it drawn is this circuit here. And this is one of our groups of students in Guatemala working on the same project that the students were in Ann Arbor. Um, and, uh, and you can see that it's all wired up. Um, we also have some fun classes. Uh, if the budget supports it, this is a place where students can actually put together a, um, a solar um, cell phone charger that actually has a battery in it. So you can charge your phone when, when the sun's not shining also. Um, and this is a great little kit to put together. It does cover, once again, all of the, the things we were talking about for circuits and solar. Um, and this is a takeaway that you can have uh, from the class where this goes into a box that we make at MakerWorks 
so that it is a, a working um, a solar charger for your cell phones. And some of the people who have taken the class, this is a, a group of students that took our circuits and solar class, same class exactly that we teach everyone. Um, two of the people there in that picture are engineers, one's from Michigan, one's from MIT. I don't know how they got along. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, happy to be taking the circuits and solar class. They're in the solar part because you see there you have big solar panels in front of them. Um, this uh, same class uh, in Guatemala, exactly the same class. This is an all woman class that was part of our Mind, Power and Light program. And you know, they all got through the class. They all understand exactly how circuits work and how to wire together a solar power system. And um, you see the graduation over on the left-hand side. One of the things we learned about working in Guatemala is that at the end of a class, pretty much anything, you have to have a graduation ceremony. So I've been to a lot of graduation ceremonies in the last 15 years. Um, so Detroit Solar, same exact curriculum, same um, uh, teaching method. Um, now, I, we translate it for different, uh, you know, for, for Spanish and English. Um, we teach it at, um, at private schools also, or have private school students come into MakerWorks uh, when we teach it from there. Once again, exact same curriculum, learning about circuits and solar power. And we teach to younger kids also. This, I think, are fifth and sixth grade students um, that we were working with. There's um, learning how to use the multimeter there. And um, uh, they also all got exactly how all of this stuff works. They wired together their own small scale solar power systems. By the way, those small scale systems have all of the components that a large scale system would have. A voltage controller, a battery, a solar panel, controls, switches, and also uh, um, uh, an inverter so that they can see that you can, um, you need an inverter to be able to plug in something like your laptop. Um, uh, uh, and direct current, they can run a light bulb with that. So they learn these things practically by, by, playing with the, um, by playing with the equipment. And then we try to have as many as possible um, demonstrations uh, where students get to go out into the field and install solar power on a community project. We'd like to install systems that are between 40 watts and 200 watts. Um, if you go smaller than 40 watts, a system is, um, it's too simple. Uh, you can get a kit that can do it. You, you don't necessarily need to wire together all of the different components. And you get over 200 watts, it also gets complicated in a different direction. It's also more expensive. So we're looking for places like community gardens where people need to pump water or have security lights on at night where we can install solar power um, at a relatively modest cost because our budgets are small. Um, uh, so that students can prepare really well to install solar power so that they all know exactly what they're going to be doing when they get out into the field. And then, of course, reality hits and everybody has to, uh, 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 everybody has to um, change their plans uh, to get the project done. But um, that's the way things work. So uh, it's, it's a good lesson for students to actually get in the field and have to adapt to reality situ the reality of the situation on the ground. Um, the hands-on part of these classes is really important for students to um, uh, have the information stick. So this is uh, one of our uh, student installation teams. Um, this is Guatemala, you can tell, because they're riding to the job site in the back of a pickup truck. Um, and we can't do that in this country. Um, but if you come volunteer with us in Guatemala, you will probably be riding in the back of a pickup truck to get to the job site. Um, I, we're, we're a little more safety conscious or, I don't know. We, we don't have as much fun in this country uh, uh, when we have to get to and from the jo job site in a school bus. Um, anyway, so this is one of the volunteer teams. You see, we have people from, uh, uh, a variety of different ages that work together. When you work with a team of volunteer, when you, and you're all invited, um, uh, volunteer with us to work on a student project in Detroit, the Detroit kids will be your teacher. You, uh, <clears throat> same thing happens, by the way, in Guatemala. The Guatemalans are the educators, they're the teachers 
of the international volunteers. This turns international volunteering on its head in that usually international volunteers think that they're gonna to go to a developing country or to a, a developing area and teach the local people about something um, because they're, you know, have experience and really it's much, um, it's, uh, it helps the self-esteem of the students and it also helps them just with their, how they um, present themselves to have to teach the international or local volunteers exactly what's going on and why we're going to do what we're going to do. Um, and so uh, it's a really positive experience for everybody to, to handle things like that. Here's some more um, volunteers working on different projects that we've had. Uh, uh, on the right hand side there, that's about the size of a um, 100 watt solar installation. It's a small voltage controller. It's a small um, uh, 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 inverter there. And, um, and that has all of the components of a larger scale solar power system, but you can mount them all on that little piece of plywood. Uh, uh, and it gives the students the experience of working in the field and also um, having to wire together all the components that go into a larger scale system. Um, when we work in Guatemala with women who have been working in the program for longer, they get more carpentry skills and they start working on larger scale solar installations and they install solar panels that are what you would see in a commercial installation now in the United States. Um, uh, but to begin with, we do the smaller scale solar installations. It's great learning experience. Um, in Detroit, there is a new series of publications. I don't know if uh, this is common knowledge, but this was new to me. Um, it says winter 2021. So um, I, I think these are just off the press. Um, but there is the Detroit Solar Toolkit, which is a well put together document on, um, on solar opportunities in Detroit. And then also the jobs and training um, Detroit Solar Toolkit is, it has what there is available for training um, in solar in Detroit, which I think is uh, an area that could be improved upon. Um, uh, there's not as much uh, opportunity for students to get their hands dirty and um, uh, install solar power as a way of learning about solar power in Detroit. Um, there's training through various well-established programs, but they, um, we'd like to augment that with a little bit more practical hands-on experiences for people. How are we doing? We're doing pretty well here on time. Um, so this is one of our students. This is Rosie. She had a, this is Guatemala, but remember, we teach the same class the same way everywhere. Um, she had a modest education before she joined the program and, um, and she stuck with it. And she's now one of the teachers in the program and teaches solar to other people. And she's also the director of sales for a solar company in Guatemala. And, um, and she can put, she can design and wire up a solar power system for a school, including all the light switches and outlets and, um, and grounding rods and circuit breakers and all of those parts that go into a regular uh, solar power system or a regular uh, uh, buildings electrical system, Rosie can design all of that stuff and she can install it and she can teach other people how to do that. And um, that's, she's just one of our star students. I wanted to show off Rosie today. So um, our plans for 2021 and 2022, we've just come out of, or we are coming out of this COVID situation, which has, been difficult for us. Um, uh, so we'll be offering Zoom after school classes. I'm really into hands-on classes. And so uh, I'm, um, I'm less excited about that than I have been about our other classes. We'll have six in-person classes at MakerWorks or at the location of, um, of the school where we'll be teaching. It, it, that's, that's open um, because we have fewer hands-on materials to carry with us. Uh, it's easier for us to work in other locations. Um, uh, we'll have more classes that are open to the public. Uh, we've started teaching just basic open to the public classes. These are, are 
partly just to get the word out about solar power and um, and the what the economics and um, sustainability profile of solar power is in 2021. Um, uh, developing our curriculum further for this area for NABCEP and International Solar Energy Society certification. By the way, Rosie just finished her International Solar Energy Society certification. I am a very proud papa there. Um, and, uh, and we want to identify uh, many more areas where we can have student demonstration projects. Uh, it, you would think that giving away solar power to a community garden or, um, or such uh, would be an easy thing to do, but to actually find a place that has a structure that would accept solar and, um, and is safe and it, it's, it's a safe place for students to work is a, um, is a challenge. And we need to reestablish our partnerships. To be honest, we really need to reestablish partnerships in Detroit, Ypsilanti, and Ann Arbor. Um, in the year of COVID, uh, we didn't stay in touch with everybody that we had been working with earlier. And so we need to, you know, that's just, that's on the list of things that we need to do. So um, getting to the end here, I am also organizing a Solarize Ann Arbor group purchase event to get solar power on, um, on people's houses. I'm gonna to talk to Julie about whether or not we can do this with commercial projects at the same time or with um, houses of worship, for example, because there's more than one place where solar power works. Um, but I have to ask her about what, what the parameters are for the program. But anyway, I'm organizing one of the, the Solarize Ann Arbor events. It's actually for Washtenaw County. So if any of you live in Washtenaw County and you haven't yet gone solar, this is the time to do it. You can do it. Um, we'll have a online Zoom discussion about this on the 12th of June. Um, I'm a little ahead of the game here. We don't really start marketing this for another couple of weeks, but I'm excited to get the word out. And I'm really excited about the program. So these are some of our volunteers. Uh, have a pretty good time when we work on projects together. Uh, just quickly finishing up here, the um, Mind, Power and Light, the program of teaching solar in Guatemala, same curriculum as we have here, was recognized by the United Nations. They gave it the Sustainia Award as one of the top 100 sustainable enterprises worldwide in 2016, which is quite an honor for a small nonprofit. Also on the right-hand side of the screen, we were, um, we got some award from, um, I can't read it because the, the screen's covered up on my screen here, but it, it says something, um, uh, American Made Solar Prize, is that it? I think it is. Anyway, we got a, a, a re received uh, recognition from the Department of Energy for a solar design that we came up with. And with that, thank you everyone for listening. And it's Earth Day. Thank you for listening on Earth Day. It's a beautiful day outside now. And uh, I'm open for questions and I'm gonna quit screen sharing. Now it's on 30 minutes. Thank you, John. And uh, you know, we have a small group here tonight so that you, you know, if you have a question, just unmute yourself. I'm gonna start though, John, with a question about uh, uh, you know, you've been doing a lot of work in Detroit, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti. Uh, is it possible for you to do something similar in a Flint, Benin Harbor, or wherever, or is that kind of beyond your capabilities? I'm thinking of both the student demonstrations and the uh, the classes themselves. Um, I, I, I talked with Angelo about this, and he was game for Flint. So Flint is in our range right now. Um, we don't have funding for any other place right now. So if, if you wanted to work on a project, we would have to uh, devise a grant together to get that to work out. But um, uh, we have the capacity to, to go larger than what we have now. And I would, be, I would love to work in Flint and Benton Harbor also, all the way over to the West Coast um, of the state. So as far north as Lansing, if, if anybody has a question, just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, John, this is uh, Ron Suarez. Can you hear me? Hey, Ron. I don't know if I'm, if there's a delay going on. 
there is a there is uh, a okay. delay, but go ahead. Oh, uh, oh, all right. So, John, we I think we met like fifteen or or twenty years ago. Uh, it was either on Main Street at the a Green Fair or Ann Arbor Bibimbap lunch A two B three. Anyhow, I'm the person who does the website, the Ann Arbor Community Commons. Uh, which is the area of the library lot where people are talking of making it a, a city center uh, kind of um, a plaza. And we've talked about putting solar power there. So I'm going to follow up with you on uh, maybe we could get some kind of student project. And we're in the middle of figuring out fundraising. So if that's uh, necessary, and I'd I, and my fantasy would be to have uh, like a miniature, like kind of dollhouse with a solar panel, but then uh, a computer uh, inside powered by that with an antenna on the roof to also demonstrate something else that I'm working on, which is decentralized internet, where just like people put solar panels on, the, on their roof, I want people to put antennas on their roof and not have to go through Comcast the way you don't necessarily have to go through DTE. So I, I have a lot to follow up with you on, and uh, I assume all your contact info is uh, connected with this presentation. I don't know if I still have your email from years ago. I think I still have your email. And also, um, I'll make the slide deck available as a PDF, uh, John, if you want to have, oh, it's already, you've recorded it, but I think it'd be faster to go. I, I, my name is on the last slide or two. I, you wouldn't want to watch the okay. whole thing after that, um, but I'd be glad to. Also, frankly, um, adding solar to a small grant project or a larger grant project, especially in Ann Arbor is something that I think is, um, is, is a positive, a net positive uh, for, for getting the grant, for being funded. So yeah, I hear that showing your I hear that showing your collaborating with others gives you extra points in your proposal. <laughs> so let's do it. Great. Anybody who has a question, just unmute and go ahead. Hey John. Hey, Aaron. So I was curious as far as your course, if you have made like video recorded each of the lessons and made like uh, kits available so that people who would be interested in taking the course but not live because of whatever reason could take the course remotely and then just maybe either order a kit or get the parts list and you know go and get the parts and whatever. Is that is that something you've done or something that we're, we're working on that. Um, uh... I taught a live class a few weeks ago and, and we had somebody in to, to record, but it was at MakerWorks and somebody started using the bandsaw right next to us um, in the next room. And so the recording was not good. Um, so we're still working on getting a good recording and we've decided to cut it up into smaller sections. So there'll be s several sort of 10 minute long sections on different aspects of solar power but then also kits that have these little solar panels and, um, and battery holders, um, that type of thing we can make into a kit that you could send somebody um, and have them work on it. And we could have a video about how to work, you know, make that kit work. The big bucket of cool solar stuff that we have for people um, uh, uh, that come to MakerWorks, and we've actually taken it on the road to Highland Park and other places. Um, that's an operation of you know, logistics. Those are, those are you know, about $200 a tub for the materials and, um, and getting them from point A to point B requires somebody with a better back than I have. So, uh, uh, but it, it's fun stuff, you know, uh, uh, once people have it in their hands. Uh, oftentimes we'll take this, all this and leave it at a school for a week because uh, we can do between four and 40 contact hours. It's a very adaptable class. It's modular. So yeah, good idea. This size stuff will be available. Um, uh, a person on my board of directors almost asked exactly what you just asked and then said, you have to do that. And I guess I'm doing it. 
Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm sure my, my kids would love to do that. I'm marking this one with your name. Okay. <laughs> this is John Freeman. Um, John, what, give me a ballpark on what it would cost to take this program to some other city that you said you needed additional funding in order to do that. Just give me a sense of the budget that's involved. Can I please get back with you on that? Uh, um, I no longer make budgets. Um, I, I'm the founder, not the director anymore. So they let me play with the toys, but they don't um, let me make budgets. So it, it, I, I can get back to you really quickly. Yeah, sure. Then, okay, send John? it to me or send it to John Sarver. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 that's the best answer I've given all evening um, is that I shouldn't give answers to things like that. I want to do it for free. John, I'd show up tomorrow if I could, um, which makes me a really bad businessman. Uh, could you send that to everyone? Um, could, if, if you send it to John Sarver, and John, could you send it to the, John, the participants? There, there's a variety of things to cover then. I'll cover like basic two day, two hour each day. Okay, we're getting a little feedback from someone. Taylor, John, why don't you mute everybody? Can you mute Clyde? Uh, Clyde, can you mute yourself? Oh, wait a minute, here I go. Excellent. Anyway, I will get the information and I'll cut it up into, because the class is modular, I'll speak of modules and costs. And um, what we've done, by the way, in order to make things COVID safe is that we have a, um, a cabinet at MakerWorks that uses um, not ultraviolet light, but it uses uh, 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 ultraviolet light makes um, what gas? Come on, somebody help me with this. Uh, ozone. Anyway. Ozone, thank you. <laughs> it makes ozone. We have an ozone cabinet at, um, at MakerWorks to make sure that all the things that people play with can get sterilized. Thank you, John. Your questions for John. Okay, well, we've got a small group. Maybe we'll wrap up early for you. Um, and, and John, uh, uh, can you give us your email address too in case people want to follow up with you? Oh, sure. Um, I'm not going to do the, the computer screen thing here. I'm going to give it to you. Um, uh, verbally, John at um, apptechdesign.org, and I'll spell it out, A-P-P-T-E-C-H-D-E-S-I-G-N.org. And um, that, you will, you will get me with that, and I will respond promptly. Um, and if you didn't catch that, you can always email me, and I could uh, give you John's email address, so. Please do. I'm Kathleen. John, would it be possible for you to talk about those other appropriate tech devices like the chiller just a little bit more? Um, those sounded very interesting. I mean, just maybe a minute or two about each one. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to dare to share my screen again. Um, And I'm going to actually go to the proper slide and then from current slide, boy, yeah, that didn't work at all. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was being so clever there. I apologize for scrolling so much. These appropriate technologies, these are three out of maybe 15 or 17 that we've come up with. The first one, the solar vaccine refrigerator, uh, I was 
I was given a challenge. I call it a challenge rather than a grant because there was so little funding involved in it um, from uh, the World Health Organization to design a refrigerator that didn't use electricity. Um, this is a long time ago. This is 2009. Solar power was more expensive. It, but a refrigerator you could make anywhere in the world out of locally available parts that would keep vaccines at a temperature of between two degrees Celsius and four degrees Celsius. Now there's some tricks to keeping your temperature that controlled um, uh, that this doesn't address with this model here. But what it does is, um, is it's under very low pressure. You take almost all the air out of this thing. Um, in the, behind there, there's a Col Coleman cooler with bottles of ethanol in it. They're connected by pipes up to that black chamber that has charcoal in it. When charcoal heats up, it cannot hold ethanol vapor and it flows out through a radiator and it fills the bottles of ethanol. Um, uh, so when it's hot, it fills the bottles with ethanol. Then at night, the charcoal cools off. It's very thirsty for ethanol vapor. And those bottles start to bubble like, um, like you just opened a bottle of uh, soda water. And then after about a minute, they look like you've shaken up a bottle of champagne and just let it explode. On all of the, 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 the fast moving molecules jump up into, they go up through the pipes and into the charcoal. And all the slow moving molecules that didn't make the trip stay behind. And slow moving molecules are by definition cold. And with a little bit of um, physics and calculations, you can figure out that you can get the temperature down to two degrees Celsius with ethanol. If you wanna go lower than that, you, know, you control the pressure. If you wanna go lower than that, use methanol. So that, that, that's essentially the trick to it. Once a day, it goes through a refrigeration cycle. Um, Actually, that one, I said, it goes through a refrigeration cycle once a day, and a 12-year-old kid told me, he said, you can get more cycles out of it than that. Just get, a, get a, um, a shade and cover it up with a shade, and it'll cool off, and then you open it up again, and it'll heat up, and you can probably get four cycles out of it. So a 12-year-old kid made that thing four times more efficient. Um, so that shows you that, that um, there's smart people everywhere. Uh, uh, the treadle pump has been remarkably uh, well received in the world. It's a simple device. It's like a stair step machine. It uses the big muscles in your legs uh, to pump water. And that can shoot water about, I don't know, it, if it's not pulling water from a very deep well, it can shoot water 25 to 35 feet with a regular garden hose. So it, it really um, can, can move water around. And um, there's a lot of places that have a dry season and a wet season, and yet there's a water table high enough that you can use a pump as simple as that to, to um, get water on your crops. And that is a problem for 100 million families uh, to, to get water to their crops during the dry season, and they live in areas that that pump will work. So that's been really popular, and a lot of nonprofits around the world have picked up on the design. They, everybody does it differently. They get the basics of how it works, how the valves work in it, and how the basic mechanism of the treadle works. And then with that, they, they come up with a, a, a different simple design. Um, and then the, the, the generator, um, that was one of the benefits of working at a place like MakerWorks. I had been talking about making that generator for years and one of the guys at MakerWorks said to me, said, John, you've talked about that for years. You've never done it. I'm going to build it for you. And he went and he built that exactly what you see in front of you there, the 100% recycled content generator. And, um, and it works like a charm. I mean, it's, it has, um, if people are familiar with generators and, 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 um, and wind turbines, this doesn't have any cogging problem. This, this is easy to start spinning. And it's yet it's still a powerful generator. So it, it, it starts out in low wind conditions and it is good up to very high wind conditions because remember, it's designed out of automotive parts. Automotive parts are designed for really strong loads. And this thing, it's not a thousand watts. And a thousand watts is just a little over one horsepower, right? So you have something that's designed for 200 horsepower and you're putting one horsepower through it. So this thing is 
structurally speaking, incredibly overdesigned. Um, but that's what you want to have in the field when you're working with in situations where technology and repairs are few and far between. We have a bunch John, more like that. John, other than the solar project in Guatemala, do any of these other appropriate technology um, designs, are they also taught by your group or does your group work specifically with the solar and you just kind of let them know that these other things are available? We, our primary things that we teach about are um, our solar power, um, uh, clean burning cook stoves, how they work, why they work the way they work, and water filters, and hand washing and sanitation, which is really an adjunct to what um, was my original goal for the appropriate technology collaborative. We actually came up with, just came up with a design for hand washing. Um, have you been to places where you step on a pedal to get your 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 liquid hand soap or your liquid you know uh, 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 sanitizer? Um, this is you step on a pedal, and a cheese grater grates off a little bit of of soap, and it drops the little soap flakes into your hands because solid soap is so much cheaper than liquid soap. And so, push on the pedal, it grates the soap puts it in your hands, and then you can go over and wash your hands. We have um, a team right now working on designing water filters that are million gallon water filters. And we're looking at a sort of five to $10 price point on those. So these are, you know, I, I can't remember the size, that, you know, how many microns or how many micro microns or whatever um, they are, but they're the high efficiency, uh, safe to drink water, water filters. And they're good for a million gallons. Um, and uh, so we have a group. Unfortunately, what happens when you have a group of engineers and designers working together is every now and then somebody can get an idea and say, you know, we're going to take this idea and run with it. And you have to have some sort of divorce uh, proceeding. And um, uh, so we may lose this, the, the, the water filter team. They'll, you know, it's an amicable divorce. Um, we'll still be very good friends, uh, but um, uh, that, that might happen with that one. Um, so we do teach about those technologies. Also, there's a solar food dehydrator that we teach about, we teach people how to make. And then I'm also proctoring students or, or mentoring students, I guess is the right term for it. Uh, uh, one is designing a refrigerator and one is designing a solar food dehydrator. And we've been teaching people how to make solar food dehydrators for many years now. Um, rural farmers need to be able to uh, preserve their food. Um, and so uh, if you have crops like mangoes and tomatoes and things that grow really well in Guatemala during the rainy season, but you have a dry season, uh, you need to be able to preserve things that'll last for six months at least. And um, just a solar dehydrator will get the mango slices and the tomatoes and the uh, um, bananas and things like that, we'll get them all to make it through at least one full season, one full year of um, pre uh, being preserved. They're also selling things. They're actually using these things to, one is making um, um, curcumin. Now, what, what did they call that in English? Um, it's Anyway, they're making a spice. They're, they're actually drying spices and herbs and selling herbs and spices in the city. So they've taken one of these relatively simple uh, technologies and, um, and uh, made it into a business. So th this is a device that costs having, paying someone to build it, it costs 500 bucks. And it ends up being for a small uh, cooperative farm, it is their source of income. A $500 device and you have, I don't know, 10 to 12 families making money, drying herbs and spices and, um, and making teas uh, that they sell in the city. So uh, a simple technology can really make a big difference in people's lives. 500 bucks, 10 families, who knew you could do that? Thank you very much, John. I appreciate that uh, extended explanation. <laughs> this is John Freeman again. I mean, have you approached any of the larger foundations to try and take some of this stuff to scale? Um, I'm not, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not a really good money guy, you know? So no, I have not. That, the simple answer is no. And yes, I should. And I'd like to try to do that now that I'm back in Ann Arbor for most of the time. Um, when I was spending a great deal of time in Latin America, it was getting a lot of these things going. At this point, it's a mature program. It has, a, you know, it runs. I should start to um, look at other ways of funding it. If you have ideas, I'd be glad to listen. Well, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I'd be interested in taking a look at the budget when you send it. Um, I just got to believe that with the, you know, it's like a perfect storm. You got climate change. You got the need to lift people out of poverty. You've got a world full of COVID viruses. And <clears throat> I don't pretend to be an expert, but for the portions of the world that don't have electricity, as you indicated, you know, we, we want to jump from having nothing to essentially solar. And yeah. you're teaching a whole generation of students how to design stuff for their own countries. And I would think like, I don't know, maybe the Gates Foundation or even the United Nations or, you know, I don't know, but it just seems to me that what you're teaching is something that would be attractive to funders. So the Mott Foundation even, you know, and they do, they do stuff all around the world. They don't do, they don't do as much in Michigan as they used to, but, you know, so that's, um, you know. Let me tell you a little bit about solar because that's, that's really been near and dear to my heart since, you know, the beginning of all of this. Um, uh, a family that switches from burning kerosene and candles to see at night to solar saves over a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent every year, okay? And European market right now for solar, for carbon trading is getting over $20 a ton, right? I've just designed a battery that lasts 20 years for these. The Department of Energy, that's what I used their money when I got the award, was, was to have them verify that uh, our battery design will last 20 years. So we have solar power systems that last 20 years in people's houses, um, which that was the weak point, by the way. Uh, but anyway. A ton of carbon dioxide every year. Um, uh, the value of a ton of carbon dioxide is, let's say, 20 bucks. Um, you can probably sell a solar lighting system that's going to last a long time on just the carbon credits. Um, but also, when people, this is just between us here on this talk, um, when people get electricity, they choose to have fewer children. And that's where you get the big carbon savings because every person represents a certain amount of carbon emissions every year, as long as they're alive, right? And so when a family goes from six to four kids, which is about what happens, because they get electricity, that's the big change. Now you can sell solar on the carbon savings for a, a ton per year per household. And, um, and we've actually done a, pilot carbon program that, that was successful. Um, but the big savings come from the fact that, that people choose to have fewer kids. By the way, if you really want to work on population, get poor people televisions. And once people get TV, that population goes straight down. Um, uh, uh, I, there's a lot of other comments I could make there. They're all off color jokes. So um, I, I'll, I'll leave it to your imaginations, but um, but what about John? What about the argument that TV is the opiate of the masses? Well, it's certainly the contraceptive of the masses. <laughs> hey, John, uh, could you mention a little about? Uh, I, I know one of the things that happened in Guatemala was you really got a lot of uh, small business activity uh, kind of going, and uh, you really got a lot of people employed in kind of uh, selling these uh, solar systems. Could you talk a little about that? Oh, sure. We have a program called Mayan Power and Light, and that's the one that won the awards. Um, uh, and that's teaching Mayan women about electricity and circuits and solar power and carpentry skills, and then helping them start solar businesses. And of all the things I just mentioned, the hard part is business skills. It's getting people to understand how to run a business, how to have reserve capital, how to um, bookkeeping, keeping customer retention uh, management, um, and, uh, and so uh, we have been teaching 
business skills, solar business skills to women. And um, uh, the first set that we did, the first group of women businesses, uh, they sold, they got solar power to 11,399 people the first year. Um, the second year, there was no funding for the program and they got solar power because they, they were business women now. They were out in the field and some dropped out and some did better. And so we got to over 10,000 people the second year without a nickel of funding. So um, these sustainable programs that we're designing are, are sustainable. People continue to work. If you're gonna make money, if you're making money, you're not gonna stop making money um, if you don't have to. So uh, the women continue to make money. And then this last year during COVID, um, uh, we had to start teaching um, we had to change everything down in Guatemala. This is what I just learned. And they, women, um, the teachers worked with the different departmental governments. This is like the county governments in different parts of Guatemala. Um, each one has to have a women's office, a women's rights office, essentially. And working with the women's rights offices, we got them to support Zoom classes in business for uh, social venture business development all over Western Guatemala. And now we have these relationships with all these different governments um, uh, who normally get in the way of things. Uh, uh, they're now on our side. They really like what we're doing. They provide us space, bandwidth. They help us organize things. They help promote our, our things. Um, and, uh, and they were able to teach classes. They were able, they actually hired people. Mind, Power and Light hired people during COVID because they had more classes and more places to teach the classes and more relationships developed during COVID than they had beforehand, which is mind boggling to me, um, considering what we all went through here in the States. There was no program for, for, for helping people. It was, you better figure it out, are you gonna starve is essentially, you know, it's pretty Darwinian down there, but our team did really well. Well, we're getting close to eight o'clock. We probably have time for one more question if anybody in the audience has a question. Uh, well, thank you very much, John. This has been uh, always uh, very interesting and enlightening to kind of hear about the variety of things you've been involved with. And uh, we'll have to have you come back at some point to kind of give us an update because you're, you're always uh, uh, doing exciting things. Well, I'll be glad to report back on our um, our solar program. Maybe Julie and I can share one of the uh, Julie's Mondays. That sounds really good. Okay, good talking to you all.